what is dogmatic theology? As we saw in previous videos, dogmatics has to do with doctrine. And also if you look, for example, at our catechism, most of the material in our catechism is dogmatics, as it discusses or covers issues of doctrine. And dogmatic theology is a scientific portrayal or presentation of doctrinal issues. And the attempt is to be methodical, to be systematic, to be comprehensive, to cover all the various aspects of dogmatics. And so it forms a coherent whole. In other words, this aspect must not contradict this aspect. All the various pieces of dogmatics, it must fit together and complement each other. Now, of course, being dogmatic can also sound like a pejorative term, but dogmatics, Christian dogmatics, is anything but being rigid or being strict or boring or, or anything like that. Dogmatics is an attempt to interpret the Bible and to interpret theology so it's also relevant for the present. So it always speaks to successive generations where theology, yeah, dogmatics must be relevant and applicable to the lives of people. And also importantly, dogmatics is never something that comes to an end. There's always continuous development. There's always change. Because as successive generations come, new challenges come our way. Just think of our modern age, our modern age of science and technology, etc. Where new challenges meet us and theology needs to address these issues. So, dogmatics is always in a state of flux. It's always developing. There are some core issues that always remain the same. But there are other issues that need refinement or change or development. Also for us as a church, we've experienced the dogmatic development. Think of our new understanding of the sacraments. Think of our new understanding of the Church of Christ. And it's not going to end now. These kind of changes, it will continue into the future. So that's one thing that we need to come to appreciate and understand, is that dogmatic theology that tries to explain the core doctrines of the Church, of Christianity, it's always in a state of flux. There's always development. There will always be change. So, what dogmatics aims to achieve is three main endeavors. And the three main endeavors is that it must be scripturally sound. So, in other words, it must be in agreement with the testimony of the Bible. So, here the Bible as a source is important. As a church, we accept that the Bible, that's a source of our doctrine. We don't get our doctrine from anybody, anywhere else. So it must be scripturally sound. Secondly, it must be confessionally sound. So in other words, it must conform to the creeds. That's of the early church and maybe even of, of the modern age, depending on the respective denomination. But like the early church creeds of Nicaea and Constantinople, etc., where the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, was established. Dogmatics must be in conformance with those early church creeds, which are universally accepted by churches as doctrinally binding. Then thirdly, dogmatics must also be appropriate to the present. In other words, it must be comprehensible for people today. It, it must address problems of the present. It must be relevant. So there are some issues of dogmatics that come, that's the tri tried and tested truths that come with us for centuries. And also today, dog dogmatics must speak to us today in terms of developments that are happening also in society today. So, dogmatics has three main endeavors. It must be scripturally sound, it must be confessionally sound, and it must be appropriate to the present. Now, if you look at the structure of dogmatic theology, so these are the major topics that dogmatic, dogmatic theology investigates. And normally it starts with God 
who is God and creation and what's God's relationship to the creation. And other aspects is Christology. Christology, that's a doctrine of the nature and task of Jesus Christ. So it investigates who is Jesus. What is the nature of Jesus? Is he God? Is he man? Is he both? How does it work? And what was his nature? Uh, or what was his task? What, what did he come to achieve? That is Christology. Then there's soteriology. And that's a doctrine of salvation. And soteriology, it comes from the Greek word soter, which means savior. And Jesus was our savior. He came to save us. So it investigates how Jesus brought salvation through his death, through his resurrection, through the forgiveness of sins, etc. And this is often followed by the doctrine of the sacraments or the means of salvation. So in other words, what's the proper teaching or understanding of holy baptism and holy communion and for us also holy sealing? And then there's also anthropology. And this is a doctrine of man. In other words, who are we? What is mankind? What is our situation? What is it that we need to alleviate our situation? Which is being trapped in sin, etc. Then there's ecclesiology. That's a doctrine of the church. And part of this doctrine is also ministry. In other words, the, normally the ordained ministers, those who minister to minister to people in the church. But that investigates who, what is the church? What does the church consist of? And how do you participate and live in the church? What are the elements of the church? So that is ecclesiology. Then normally, dogmatic theology, the last aspect that is covered is eschatology. And eschatology means the doctrine or the teaching of the last things. And that looks at the, beyond, the world of the beyond. In other words, life after death or the future, the future things. So it investigates the return of Christ for us. Also, the thousand-year kingdom of peace, the final judgment, the new creation. So these are aspects that eschatology investigates. We can also briefly mention that there are other aspects like pneumatology, in other words, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit that could be investigated. So a list, list that you see on the screen now, it's not exhaustive. There are other lists or topics that are investigated in dogmatic theology. But these are some of the main ones that if you would go and study dogmatics, these are the fields or specific topics that you will investigate in further detail. Now, if you look at important works of dogmatic theology, in the early church, there were people like Origen and Augustine who made very important contributions to dogmatic theology. For example, Origen, he wrote a lot. He was a very important thinker in the early church. And also Augustine in his writings, for example, The City of God and other writings that he produced. He gave out some core doctrines. And remember, like I mentioned in an earlier video, it, was, it is with him where we get the origins of the doctrine of original sin and the doctrine of predestination. So these two, Origen and Augustine, also others, made very important contributions towards dogmatics. And, it, and if we move forward to the higher Middle Ages, if we look at scholasticism, this is the time period of, of people like Thomas Aquinas and William of Ockham. For example, Thomas Aquinas, he wrote a work called the Summa Theologica, where he also used like the philosophy of Aristotle, and he worked on it, and he developed it, and he made theological statements, this interaction between philosophy on the one hand and also the revealed scripture or the, that what, what has genuine authority in scripture, the, the vision of faith. And also William of Ockham, if you're aware of Ockham's razor, that says 
The simplest explanation is the best. That's the one you must use. It originates with this William of Ockham, who produced important writings after Thomas Aquinas. Now, if we move ahead to the time of the Reformation. Now, of course, Martin Luther, he spearheaded the Reformation, but his own writings was very sporadic. He didn't put out a systematic description of his doctrine or of his understanding. And the systematic description of Lutheran theology actually was done by Philip Melanchthon. And Philip Melanchthon, he was a close friend of Luther, and he was actually a genius. He was absolutely brilliant. He started attending university at the time, at the age of 12. And already at the age of 15, he qualified for a master's degree. But the university didn't want to give it to him because he was too young. But he, he continued with his studies, and he was a genius with language, with linguistics. And he already wrote books at an early age about Greek grammar, etc. But Philip Melanchthon, he's the one that produced what is known as the loci communis, or the loci communis. And this loci communis was first published in 1521. And here, Melanchthon gave a systematic description of Lutheran doctrine, also using something that's known as a synthetic method. And here, the loci, here the loci means places or chapters or specific headings and they followed he followed Paul's writing in the book of Romans so he approached it the various chapters following Romans there's free will that's addressed then sin the law then the gospel grace justification and faith old and the new covenants and the sacraments etc so this was his method that Melanchthon used to describe this Lutheran understanding of the doctrine this loci communis and Melanchthon also wrote what is known as the Augsburg Confession that, that he presented in 1530 this is also an important profession of Lutheranism Martin Luther did not present this himself before the emperor at the time because he was afraid he would be arrested and burned at the stake. So Philip Melanchthon, who wrote this Augsburg Confession, he delivered it to the emperor and the princes of Europe of the time on Martin Luther's behalf. So this is Philip Melanchthon, this brilliant person, longtime friends with Martin Luther, who produced this systematic portrayal of Lutheran doctrine in this writing called the Loci Communis that was first published in 1521. Then also there's a writing of John Calvin. And as it ended up in 1559, there was a massive two-volume work called The Institutions. And this was that one of the most important writings also at the time of the Reformation. And the first edition of this actually appeared in 1536. And you must understand that John Calvin, he was not actually trained in theology. And he was actually a lawyer. But in 1536, he explained or he wrote this first edition of the institutions. Actually, just to demonstrate that the French part of the Reformation, or the French followers of the Reformation, they were not some radical group on the radical French, like another group called the Anabaptists. And this first edition wants to explain to the ruling authorities of the time, no, this is our theology, we're not radical. So in a kind of a similar vein, it followed also the loci communis in terms of, of, of that example, in terms of the theology that, that was explained. And there was a further edition of the institutions in 1539. And this book had 17 chapters. And yeah, the structure 
became more creedal following the creeds of the early church, where it addresses the Father, and then the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, and then the church. Now, John Calvin himself said that what you find in the institutions is not supposed to be complete. It's not a comprehensive explanation of, of Christian theology or dogmatics. And he insisted if you want to find out what Christian theology is about, you must perform exegesis of the biblical texts. But if you want an overall understanding or complete picture how it fits together, then you can consult the institutions. And like I said, like I said in the end, the final edition of 1559, it was a massive two-volume edition and one of, one of the most important contributions to the Reformation. So this is John Calvin and his, his very important writing, The Institutions. Now we also move to the time period after the Reformation. And you might wonder, why are we covering these theologians? Because of course we are the New Apostolic Church, we follow the Apostles' Doctrine, their teaching, their interpretation of the Scriptures. So why would we know about these other theologians? But if you study theology and you want to also, to a degree, understand our theology as a church, it's important to be aware that we are part of a larger conversation. We're not an island. We're not isolated. Our own theological development or our own dogmatics always happens in relationship to other churches around us. So we're not in isolation. So we need to be aware of, of what happens around us and also what happened in the past. If you refer to your reference book, you'll see many theologians are referred to. And I, yeah, in this video, I will just focus on one or two or three just to give you an idea or an inclination of what the matter is about. For example, we look at now Friedrich Daniel Ernst Schleiermacher, and he lived in 1768 to 1834. And at the end of his career, he was a professor and also a minister in church in Berlin. And what makes him important is he was the church father for the Protestants of the 19th century. The main, one of them, the main thinkers of the 19th century. And he arrived on the scene when there was much upheaval. This is now the time of the radical enlightenment where people were, or intellectuals were very strong against faith, against religion, against Christianity. It was a time of upheaval. And so Friedrich Schleiermacher, he arrives at this time and he wants to reconcile Christian tradition, Christian faith. And he wants to reconcile th with the culture of the time. And that includes education, art, and even the sciences. Because at this time there was so much scientific discovery. People said the only thing that you really can know is by our human reason and science leads to truth and true knowledge, you cannot rely on faith and religion for this anymore. So Friedrich Schleiermacher, he arrives on the scene in this period and he actually wrote a book called Glaubenslehre, or also called in English the Christian faith. And he wants to reconcile Christian faith and Christian dogmatics with the contemporary cultural trends of the time. Especially he wants to overcome this antithesis between faith and science, or faith and reason as it was used and understood by some intellectuals of that time. So this is Friedrich Schleiermacher, who was active in the 19th century and made a very important contribution to theology at this time. Now if you move forward to an important dogmatic theologian of the 20th century, and for, for many, Karl Barth was the most important theologian of the 20th century. And Karl Barth, he wrote initially a commentary on Romans, 
then later on he started on a monumental work called Church Dogmatics, which at the end, when he passed away, was not even complete. But for Karl Barth, it was very important that theology that's done in the academy, at the universities, and the theology done in the church must come together. Indeed, theology must be done in the service of the church, especially for preaching. That is what theology is about, is to preach the word of God. And this emphasis on preaching the word of God came to be called dialectical theology, or the theology of the word of God. Karl Barth reacted against what was known as the liberal theology of his time, and he wanted to set a new foundation for doing theology. But for him, it was very important that theology must be done in the service of the church, and it must be done in the service of preaching. And Karl Barth, he lived at also at the time of Germany and the Nazis coming to power, and he was also part of the Confessing Church, and the Confessing Church opposed other German Christians who swore allegiance to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. And he also was a main person who contributed to what is known as, as the Barman Declaration, in terms of this is the principles of faith, especially like from a Protestant point of view, and also in its fight against Nazism, because Hitler was also nearly regarded as the savior figure, this messianic figure, and this absolute leader who, who claimed absolute loyalty and allegiance, even over and above Christian faith and allegiance. So Karl Barth is a very interesting figure. He also became involved in social activism, helping people in his community, especially those who were oppressed and exploited by factory owners. So he was quite a prominent theologian, and he produced this monumental work called Church Dogmatics. And also, I want to mention just a few contemporary theologians, just also for us to be aware of. If you're interested, you can go and find out more about these theologians who also made important contributions to dogmatic theology. For example, from the Catholic Church, there are authors like Karl Rahner, also Joseph Ratzinger was an important contributor to dogmatics, and also Emmerich Koreth. If you look more to the Protestant side of people who produce important works on dogmatics, it's people like Paul Tillich, who refer to God as, as the ground of being or being itself. It was more kind of philosophical type of theology. There's also Gerhard Eberling, who, pro, who did a more kind of hermeneutic theology. Then there's also Wolfhard Pannenberg. Wolfhard Pannenberg said that the whole of history, this includes the Bible, is a revelation of God. And then there's also Jürgen Moltmann. And it might be interesting that other theologians of for a long time, eschatology, the return of Christ, this hope for the future, it died out in the church. Also the Protestant church. And Jürgen Moltmann, he brought emphasis back to this future aspect of the church. Jesus is coming and we live in hope in view of this future coming of Jesus. So these are just some theologians who made contributions to dogmatic theology. There are many more, but it's just to give you an understanding that as a church, the theological and dogmatic currents that occur in the world, we are part of that. We are not in isolation. Although we are informed by apostles' doctrine, our doctrine also speaks to elements of dogmatic theology existing outside of our church. So, this was the last video for chapter 1. And now we will change our focus to the content of chapter 2, and we will start off with dogmatics development in the early church. Mm -hmm.